Welcome to The Vault at 201 North Broadway, podcast for innovators and problem solvers talking all things small business, entrepreneurship, and workforce development. This guest has been on our interview list since the start of The Vault. He was an early adopter to Rock 31 before it is what it is today. He's an entrepreneur a few times over, a former cop, and yes, we'll get into that later, and so much more. Thank you to the Small Business Development Center for sponsoring The Vault at 201 North Broadway. The Small Business Development Center provides free one-on-one counseling, business plan assistance, market research, financial projection assistance, and more to small businesses. Welcome to The Vault, Carl. We're so glad to have you here with us today. I am honored to be invited. (laughs) Um, We're really excited. Uh, To kick us off with this episode, can you tell us, we just want to jump right in, about your journey as a kid growing up in Billings? And then college and beyond. Yeah. To infinity and beyond. I grew up on the West End of Billings. I born and raised here. Um, Grew up on the West End, Arrowhead Elementary, through the first four years of my life. um, And had a lot of my great formative experiences there. I mean, I attended my first day of kindergarten without my two front teeth and a huge fat upper lip because I'd crashed a bike the day before. (laughs) And made one of my childhood. Oh. I probably have those. <laughs> Remember, my childhood best friend came up to me on the first day of kindergarten and, and introduced himself with this lovely line. What happened to your face? <laughs> you guys are, are best friends ever since. Well, not ever since, but we, we, we <laughs> made it through a lot of childhood together. It was a ton of fun. So, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, my my fa- fabric and foundation are all a part of Billings. So uh, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to go to the Catholic schools here. Uh, went over in about fifth grade. Um when I went, I went to the, this is back before there was this consolidated single, uh, St. Francis school in mm-hmm. Colton. So I, I went to St. Pius for fifth grade and went over to frat in sixth grade. And, uh, at St. Francis upper school at frat, um, had the good fortune of meeting a, a lifelong spiritual mentor, Father Leo, who's now back in town as the parish priest at St. Patrick's Co Cathedral. I joined the church under his tutelage. Um, and that was kind of the first place where I started to run that borderline between real adult opportunities and still very much being a kid. So uh, I was invited to be a lector uh, at the church so I could read at mass and stuff like that. Uh, I was an altar server there. I was invited to serve at funerals and it just, it was a beautiful way to tie kind of this growth and development into both my spiritual development and personal development. Yeah. I developed a lifelong love of public speaking though I'm really kind of an introvert and I think mm-hmm. that'll be a surprise to both of you because I can <laughs> definitely, I was just like, what? Yeah. No, yeah, I... but reading like at starting at that young of an age. I mean, I didn't enjoy reading at church. So I would like alter serve and do other things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. But then slowly over time you get enough practice and you realize no matter how bad you mess it up, you survive and you keep moving forward. Exactly. So I've, I've taken that into a ton of opportunities to be public speaking, all this. Uh, Nobody knows that you messed up. Like, no, no one else knows how to pronounce that weird word. (laughs) No, I mean, they're going to take your word for it. (laughs) No one knows. And they're going to say, hey, that's that's how you say that. Yeah, Take this back to the original Hebrew and then really come at me. (laughs) I like to I just I love that you said that, because when we talk to people um, and they're like, oh, God, I feel like I messed that up. And I'm like, yeah, but we only know that because you just told us that we never would have known that you messed that line up or you said that fact a little weird or something like that. So, well, we could always call the Jamie and have him fact check for us. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Look, look it up, Jamie. Hey, Google, Google that for me. <laughs> Google that. <laughs> so, public speaking from an early age. Early, kind of early age. That. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Love that. Went to Central High. Um, uh, in my formative years, I played a lot of hockey. Love playing hockey, but uh, couldn't couldn't play any longer after about eighth grade, and so that was very sad for me. But I moved into high school with this kind of like new unveiling of who I wanted to be. So I joined the soccer team. We were definitively, and without a doubt, I could bring the data to support it, the worst soccer team in the state of Montana. (laughs) Interesting, because now Central kicks out great soccer teams. There was no class A. There was just soccer. So we had 400 kids, most of whom loved football, and a couple of us miscreants that wanted to try this European footy. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) I was a freshman the second year Central had a team. We lost every single game we ever played in all the way up until my senior year when we played against laurel the only other class a team that had finally built a program we beat them three to two 
And so we went off undefeated in Class A games, having only played one. And we declared ourselves the first ever state Class A champions, unofficially. <laughs> That's where it started, the championship streak. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. But actually, I, I learned a lot from that. And, and in life, I've looked back on those experiences with a very interesting amount of reflection where being bad at something for so long gave me a level of perseverance that I did not possess prior to. And I got really comfortable with the idea of like learning through losing. And so I looked back years later, I had a friend of mine come to me and say, you know, for as much as you've talked about your time in soccer and how bad you guys were, she goes, have you ever gone back and looked at your statistics? I said, well, it's pretty clear. Like we didn't score goals and they scored a lot more than we did. And so, you know, we were bad. And she goes, no, no, no. You as a goalkeeper, because I was a goalie on the team. She goes, what have you done? And have you gone back and looked? And so I went and started pulling some newspaper articles from back in the day and found out. And I still have not reported this to MHSA. I need to (laughs) put it to the athletic director and officially submit it. But um, I had a single game where I stopped more shots than any goalie in the history of Montana high school soccer has stopped in a single season. So you're holding a record. I'm holding it close to my chest though. Now that it's out in the podcast world, maybe I should pursue it, but like we were, we were really bad, but being the goalie on a team that's really bad gives you a lot of real world experience. And so, right. Cause you're holding, like think of how many other points could have been scored. Exactly. Like your defense was on point. Yeah. 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 So it was it was a really unique and weird experience to get all the way to the end of and then finally look back and go, oh, actually, we really did get good. We, we had one game that we didn't lose against a double-A team. We tied West High in a 0-0 tie game. They finished the game with the car lights on. They were not going to call a game for darkness. So the cars in the parking lot had the lights on. We're listening for balls to be kicked as we stopped it. <laughs> and, and we held them to a shutout. And so in that game, I can't remember the exact number. It was somewhere around like 38 saves in oh, wow. one game. Oh, wow. So because... And, and I don't want to diminish my teammates. We, we had not developed a program. We, we, were, we were trying to compete against schools that were four times as good as us. I, it's nothing about them. Because when I took the field, the, the result was the same too. Mm-hmm. But uh, because we could not produce offense, because we could not stop the onslaught of these other teams, I got a lot of opportunities. Like there, there aren't soccer games where people shoot 38 shots on both sides of the field. Yeah. Right, because that's so... Here I am getting mm-hmm. shelled into Swiss cheese. So... <laughs> I learned that that you can always take lessons away. Like you can you can no matter what the experience has been good, bad or otherwise, you can learn through it as long as you got a mindset about doing that. So I love uh, that. many other wonderful experiences through Central High and lots of networking, lots of people that I got to know through that space and it was just a beautiful place to go to school with a lot of wonderful classmates. And when I departed, I wanted to go off to see other things in the world. Um, so knowing that I'm a bit of a homebody and not really one to go out and like meet and connect and make friends and all this kind of stuff, I decided that I would leave the state so that I didn't go where all my friends were, where it was comfortable, force myself into a position of uncomfort. But I went to the Twin Cities where I had a lot of family so I could still get a home cooked meal, mm-hmm. run into my sister from time to time. And uh, so I went to the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. Oh, and nice. again, definitively formative experience, things that I picked up about the, I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas, the, the doctor of the church, the, one of the most brilliant minds to ever exist, philosophically writing things like the Summa Theologia, a fascinating individual with this beautiful Dominican root. And all of a sudden you come out of this Dominican discipline, Catholic school about philosophy and logic. And you look back all these years later and you're like, oh, that's why I behave that way. <laughs> I was, that's why I, I was in the pot long enough to become part of the chili and so yes <laughs> i like that <laughs> well and like refl- it sounds like you do a lot of which I, I think is a valuable thing of like reflecting on some of those past experiences that you've had that have maybe built and helped you make the choices that you've made today i think to some degree too i just turned 40 so Happy like birthday. A, yeah, thank you yes. very much. Two weeks ago, I turned 40, but there's also this period of reflection as you approach these milestones where you do kind of look back and ask those questions deeper. I mean, that I, I shouldn't say that in my entire life, I've been deeply philosophical and looking at my upbringing is like, where is it this formative thing? But as you start looking at the second half of the game, it's like, you know, what have I become? How did I become that? And how do I influence who I want to be by taking the history of how I got here? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, those, those formations were incredibly important. I walked out of St. Thomas with a degree in uh, sociology and uh, criminal justice. 
Awesome. Because I was going to save the world and be a law enforcement officer. Um, it was a very strange thing. My family is pure business. There are bankers, there are entrepreneurs, a couple of engineers smattered throughout, but it's just, we do business. So I was definitely the black sheep of the family. Mm -hmm. Being um, the cop in the, yeah. <laughs> and it came out of this really, I mean, it's a strange and, you know, tragic thing, but again, you are the formation of the events that happened to you. I was a freshman in high school and I witnessed a man, uh, murdered when I was in Hardin, oh, wow. Montana. And it was, you know, it changes you. It changed it. It was, it was an absolute tragedy. It was terribly sad. The circumstances around it, I would learn later when I came back to be a police officer mm -hmm. in Hardin. Um, but it was, it was very, very formative in who I decided I would become following that. And so different than anybody else in my family, because of this experience that was very acute and very unique, mm -hmm. I decided that I would you know, be the cause for justice in the world. So yeah. I came back here wanting to be a police officer. I thought at some point I'd want to go into federal agencies, the FBI or something like mm -hmm. that. But I started as a, a sheriff's deputy in Hardin, for the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office. I worked underneath um, T. Larson Medicine Horse, who was just an amazing human being and um, got to spend about 18 months in that department really kind of trying to give back to a community that had, again, through trauma and tragedy, informed the direction of the future of my life. So mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years here in Billings as a police officer on the beat and uh, some time in Billings Senior High as the school resource officer. I had a really unique opportunity transitioning from Big Horton to Billings. I caught a, a training for what was called crisis intervention training. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very young in my career to be offered the opportunity to go to that, and I took it. And so then when I came to Billings, I had the unique opportunity to be a fully certified trainer of this technique, despite, you know, I actually technically was uh, issuing the training at Billings to officers before I worked in Billings who would later become my training officers. Oh, wow. So I was this instructor to them <laughs> prior to them teaching me how to be a cop. So it was a, it was a kind of a unique uh, turnabout, but uh, that kind of informed my career. It was definitely a, a deeply meaningful approach to a different world of community policing. We looked at mental health and behavioral health. We looked at addictions and co-occurring disorders. We looked at people in crisis and tried to create good prognostic skills in police officers so that they could handle moments of crisis differently than we would have been trained tactically. Mm -hmm. And boy, it was a richly rewarding part of my career. And then that kind of informed my almost social work side of being a police officer that worked really well also being a school resource officer. How long were you a police officer for? Just shy of 10 years. Okay. Yeah, just shy of 10 years. I was in the middle of my ninth year. Uh, my wife and I were pregnant with our first child, Michael, uh, eight-year-old boy. He was born uh, December 13th of uh, 2014. Oh, awesome. And, uh, that's so crazy to yeah. think about, too, for a moment. Yeah. Just like 2014. Like, that's his <laughs> yeah. year of birth, 2014. <laughs> Done. And we moved forward. And it was, it was, so I didn't, I didn't want him to think there's a very, very strong prevalence of, of um, men specifically in law enforcement whose fathers are cops. And they kind of see this as like a family calling. And I have no problem with him joining the ranks of law enforcement, but I didn't want him to feel the pressure of like, well, dad does this. And so I should do this. He can be whatever he wants to be in the world. Uh, it, but he will fly fish. Uh, but other than that, he can be anything he wants to be in this world. Um, but uh, I didn't want him to feel those pressures and there were other opportunities for me. So I, I left the world of law enforcement in spring of 14 at the end of the school year and ventured out into the world of business and healthcare. Awesome. And that's how Billings has kind of informed my upbringing. Yeah. No, that, I, that was a really fun um, to learn some of that stuff about you and what kind of shaped some of those things that led you to what we're going to hear about next. Yeah. Wait, one one thing. Yes. D.A.R.E. program. Did you ever have anything to do oh, with it? Oh, interesting. I, I yeah. loved the D.A.R.E. program. And before we move on quick, because you kind of, I mean, you know, cop, hardened, billings. And then, you know, for some of those listening that maybe aren't as familiar, like I'm not as familiar, um, a school resource officer. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? So, and, you know, and how did you get into that? at the school, you know, coming from Hardin and then back to Billings, doing some trainings. And then how does that all circulate into what a school resource officer is? Yeah. So let, let's start with the D.A.R.E. question, because then that kind of informs the the national formation on the school resource position. So uh, D.A.R.E. Drug, drug Abuse Resistance Education Program was developed in the 80s out of the Nancy Reagan Just Say No to Drugs world. Um, and, and D.A.R.E. was definitely something that had its day in the sun. I think its intentions were pure. But eventually we got to this spot where, um, and I think if you talk to people and ask the questions, right, you'll find this to be resoundingly true. I was very resistant to understanding it 
as well because I appreciated the program that I have. I'm actually still friends with uh, uh, John Wrights, who is my DARE officer. Oh, uh, see, yeah. yeah he's the, a wonderful human being. The DARE program was so much fun. Yeah, I ran into him years later. But what one of the things that they found was that the uh, abuse resistance uh, kind of sat in the background, but the drug awareness definitely became the forefront. And so if you talk to most people our age, um, and a little older in the cohort, when you say like, where was your first knowledgeable experience of, and where did you first become aware of the existence of illicit drugs? And they were like the dare program. <laughs> there was this police oh, officer no. <laughs> who drove to my school in a really cool car that they'd stolen from a drug dealer and showed us sacks of pretty looking pills and told us that people use these to escape their life when things are really bad and they oh. make them feel better for a brief period of time. But in the long run, it's not good. So subtlety of that to a third grader. <laughs> cool cars come from drug dealers. These things make you feel good when you feel bad. Oh, see, my missing that other part of like, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I feel like we got like pictures of people with no teeth and we're like, drugs will do this to you. <laughs> Definitely we had, a like, component. Yeah. Stuff about meth a lot because yeah. like that was more prevalent when I was younger. Definitely a component. I think as drugs have become more immediately addictive and more immediately problematic, there's definitely some of that that has rung true. But I think, you know, again... I know we're a very similar cohort when people break us into generations, but I would be one of the pioneers of our uh, millennial generation. <laughs> I'm on the <laughs> on the other side of other the spectrum. End. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we'll just acknowledge it without using numbers. Yes. I'm still a millennial. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, but they were just piloting the program, and one of the things that they found out was that they taught us all the drugs existed, and if things were bad in your world, this might make you feel better for a time. And you know, for people who are feeling bad in their world, sometimes better for a time is is good enough. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of people that that started turning to drugs. So there was this rapid acceleration. It's hard to determine if that's a function of like drug economics or if that's a function of education, but they definitely peeled back on that. So I, I had the same response that you did. Yeah. Like what happened to this program? Yeah. And all of a sudden that's it's like, that's interesting. Cause I remember hearing about it, but then yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got our dare T-shirts for graduating, and it's an yeah. interesting thing. The human brain does not learn negatives as rapidly as they learn affirmatives, right? So when you're looking at something and trying to figure out how to teach somebody something, you want to teach to the path that you want them to follow, not teach to the path that you want them to avoid, because it takes four times as much thinking power to process a negative, and that happens both on a longevity basis as well as on an immediacy basis. So you think about, and you know, like you can look at this from like race car drivers or other stuff, but the game where you put your hand on the table and you tap in between your fingers and you know sometimes people do this with dangerous implements right yeah like the what do they call it russian roulette no that's a little different game oh. consequences immediate <laughs> don't ever play that but but this tapping through the fingers game if you think about the positive which is tap the table you'll be able to tap the table at unbelievable accuracy and rapidity but if you look at it and say don't tap your fingers the first stroke down you are going to tap your finger Right. Same thing when you're driving cars really, really fast. People are like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to hit the whatever. And they will hit the whatever. So, again, while we're in the training academy and they're teaching us how to slalom and how to do all this really fun high speed maneuverability stuff, they're saying, don't think about the consequence. Think about the action. Drive through the gap. Drive through the slalom. Hit the gap. Hit the, hit the, and all of a sudden you see this stuff start to make sense where at high, high speed, if you're driving through a slalom of pylons and you think, oh my gosh, I can't hit a pylon. Your brain says hit pylon and you've already hit it and then don't. And then so you're like, okay, so the opposite of hitting the pylon is driving through the gap and you've like hit 50 pylons and everything's a problem. So when you want to hit things, don't think of the consequence. So we're training through this program dare that has this longevity that has drugs, access, feel good temporarily bad. That's that fourth process in the thing that all of a sudden sends you into this deeply supported loop of trying to figure out what it is, as opposed to saying, hey, if you want to be an astronaut someday, obviously that stuff can't be on the table. Follow people that are astronauts. What do they do? They're up at five and they're working out and they're getting a doctorate and they're learning all these different things about their life and trying to improve and better themselves. So it's this positive line of thinking towards where you want to become as opposed to the things that you ought to avoid. I like that a lot. So all of that then changes. Um, DARE research is kind of showing that there's a problem inside of that space. School resource officers become a function of security in the advent of school shootings, Columbine, some of these major 
catastrophic events, they start suggesting that armed security is appropriate and the best armed security is going to be like licensed law enforcement. And so they're putting them in schools. But then on top of that, as they're present in schools, and thankfully this stuff doesn't happen all the time, and thankfully this stuff is super rare, though incredibly tragic, it's kind of like, what do we do with somebody that we're paying to be in a school 40 hours a week? I I mean, they need to be there. But what else can we do? And so then it had become this informed triangle of law enforcement as the core of what you do, leaning against this social work component of working with students to find best resource and a combination of education. And so you kind of wear three hats all at once. You're a teacher, you're a counselor, and you're a cop. So if there's law to be enforced, you enforce. If there's classes to be taught, you teach. If there's kids that need help, you find resources. I loved my student resource officer in high school. Who was yours? I can't remember his name right now. Where'd you go? Capital in Helena. Um, but he was awesome. And every, we'd have a word of the day and he would put it on his whiteboard. McKay. No, not McKay. I'm not sure. It's a very small community. Helena? No, just the oh, body the of school resource, resource officers. officers. We know, we know yeah. each other pretty well. So, but yeah, he was, he was great. And he would, you know, walk the halls and... You know, monitor, but he would also be a pal. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I always liked I like the Dare program, and I like the student resource officer. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. I mean, I remember the Dare program, and then like a couple others, but we didn't have a student resource officer. No, we, your guys' resources would have been fairly limited in uh-huh. Eastern Montana. Yep. So yeah. it's different, but I think one other thing you have mentioned to me that you maybe didn't mention yet that helps us transition into. You left, and then you you be you did business, yes. right? Um, which I want to know about that because you talked about being the black sheep in your family, and then kind of some of those transitional things where you decided, you know, what were those things? You, you had a kid, and and some of those other things that helped you go into that. But your MBA yes. in healthcare, yes, you did pre cop. No, I, or, I was looking at higher education in general as I knew I was going to be moving on to something else. Okay, so the final impetus was the birth of my son. So Michael was definitely why we were moving towards this. But I'd been looking at it for a while. I'd taken the LSAT and uh, considered law, um, put in a couple applications, was looking at a few different schools, and then ultimately just thought, you know, that really isn't where I want to be. Um, it's too close to where I am. My wife and I, when we were dating, uh, did quite a bit of brewing. So we were home brewers, and this is back before there was this you know, closed market. It was kind of in the infinite market space of, of brewing. And so we looked at opening breweries. So we'd toured the state and picked towns that would have good populations where we could brew and sell beer. And so looked at a couple of different communities in that capacity. And I ultimately decided at that time, though I would be passionate about it, my passion wouldn't surpass my education. And I didn't know enough academically about the business side of running things to just jump out there and take the risk. So... Uh, the business that I ended up moving into was a family business. So my parents had founded it, um, in 1983, the year that I was born. Um, and so I kind of grew up around the kitchen table where I always say I got, I I got my first master's degree at Joe and Kathy's table. (laughs) (laughs) So I got a master's from them. And then I went out and formalized it in university of St. Thomas again. And this time they, uh, they definitely put it in, in writing, but I I got my first master's degree from my parents Mm -hmm. sitting around the dinner table, talking business daily, talking strategy, talking leadership, talking healthcare, talking policy and, and all kinds of different stuff. It was just, they didn't hide that from us. It was very much a part of our family life. And so we, we, were passionate about learning about it. So even Mm -hmm. when I was in college and undergrad studying stuff that wasn't a part of that, I was working in the company doing side projects and demography studies and marketing analysis and all this kind of stuff because it was tangent to the fields that I was studying Mm -hmm. and I could do it. And you kind of got that experience, you know, you kept that family. Yes, for sure. That's so funny. We had Bo with School District 2 on a few weeks ago Mm -hmm. and he said the most, like it all starts at the kitchen table. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, he they they truly believe that that that's where your kids going to do their homework. That's where they're going to learn their life lessons, their manners, their all of that. It just happens at the kitchen table. I just sold that kitchen table last week. Oh wow! <laughs> Under duress, and I love my wife more than I love my kitchen table. But last <laughs> and week, she was like, "Sell the kitchen." Oh table. yeah, she, she was quite <laughs> get rid of it. Quite done with it. But uh, yeah, it went out the door um, last week to a couple, and I made sure I told them on the way out. My family found at the table. And founded the business at the table. Like, this table matters to me. And they're like, great, here's 25 bucks. Facebook weirdo. 
Who knows what they'll do, what (laughs) things they'll create around that table I hope they do. I hope there's something magic about the table. It certainly had a magical whimsy to me. So yeah, that was, I mean, that was where I really learned a passion for healthcare and a passion for serving differently. And again, parents are both very, very informed and deeply faith-filled people. And so again, they led the company as an extension of their their culture of faith in the Mm -hmm. family. So the the company existed in that space already. It was very easy to come into and then lead it in that direction because it had already kind of started that way. So mm-hmm. the company was Health Management Services. Um, it runs nursing homes, uh, critical access hospitals, assisted livings. It builds and designs all kinds of things in rural medicine. Uh, my, my tagline to people is, if you live somewhere rural, if you think it's medicine and if it's important to your community, we can probably try and save it. Mm-hmm. So we worked in a lot of different communities over the years. Um, the, the the most the, the hardest years in long-term care in the state of Montana um, have been the last three at the dawn of COVID and at the uh, amount of funding that the nursing homes were receiving. We had been in a very critical space. I think anybody that reads the newspapers can see the closures that were out. Um, and those were things that we as a company were predicting, um, you know, eight years ago and trying to put in front of the state that uh, they, that, that, they had cut Medicaid rates and they had expanded Medicaid. And I believe in the Medicaid expansion program. It just creates an unfortunate economic influence for, for nursing homes, but it caused critical problems that we were predicting. The only thing that really stayed the problems on the timeline that we were looking at was the funding that came through COVID. But the hardest years of nursing homes have been the last three. There have been a few small changes that have come. Um, we'll see if those things are a stitch in time to save nine or if it's going to continue to to be problematic. So you have this business endeavor, but you, you're not just a one-stop shop. You have multiple things that you have your hands in. I like business. Yeah. I like business. I like starting businesses. I like being involved in businesses. So it seems like you like solving problems. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. Um, uh, as a kid, I was definitely, it comes from, it comes from a root in who I was as a child. This is most things do, right? So mm-hmm. I, I, I was a gearhead. I loved cars, passionately loved cars, loved studying cars, the history of them. Um, and What's your dream car? We asked this station. Yeah. Yeah. Us. So this is it. And, and I'll never afford one. Uh, but the 1948 Tucker Torpedo. Nine, okay. 1948 Tucker Torpedo. Jamie, look at this. Look, look us up so you can take a look at it. It's, it is, and, and, and this is, Preston Tucker was the man uh, who, who invented this vehicle. It was the single most innovative thing to happen to the automotive industry since they put gasoline enclosed cylinders on the backs of bicycles. It is unbelievable what this car was capable of. Um, Henry Ford revolutionized the way cars were made. This changed the way cars behaved forever. And so this man, Preston Tucker, who I studied a couple of different times throughout childhood, and there's a movie, Preston Tucker, The Man in His Dream, all this kind of stuff, is this passionate problem-solving entrepreneur. So his first invention is this rotary turret that he was putting on top of military vehicles in the mid-30s, like right at the dawn of like European war and before America was in it. Those turrets then became the rotary global turrets that you see on the bottom of B-17s, um, B-24s, Liberators, um, some of the the, the British um, uh, equipment that they were running through World War II. It was fascinating. It was lightweight. It was highly mobile. It was everything they needed these things to be. And it was because he looked at things differently. So then he came back after the war effort was done and he'd been successful in manufacturing and started looking at essentially this concept of like saving lives through innovation. And he invented this car. And so this car was the first car to ever have fuel injection in a mass production car. Well, mass production, they made 48 of them. So um, he was the first man to ever create fuel injection. So he created this horizontally opposed air-cooled helicopter engine. So it would use less fuel, it would use less coolant, it would use less oil and run better. It got like 25 miles to the gallon. It was fuel injection. It ran on a hydrostatic transmission like a tractor does, but it could go speeds of, you know, 75, 80 miles an hour. It was slated to eventually be- It's cool looking. We'll share photos, listeners. (laughs) So he goes from the back end to the front. He's the first person to put disc brakes in cars to improve, to decrease improving, decreasing stopping distances in cars so they would avoid accidents. He put crumble zones in before they had a name because of the way that the hoods were designed. He put a padded dashboard in because he decided that the car surviving the wreck wasn't as important as the people surviving the wreck. He put seat belts in. 
Oh, wow. And it has three headlights. So it's this incredibly unique four-door sedan that just runs like a bat out of Hades. And that third center headlight then also pivots with the steering wheel so that when you're turning into a corner, the headlight actually turns to eliminate what's on the inside of the corner so that you can see to avoid pedestrian traffic, all this kind of stuff. And he's just one of those guys who steps in and says, we could do better and we can do different. And so his path for innovations coming in, I mean, he wasn't a car guy. He didn't know anything about cars. I mean, he just, he had to hire everybody that he needed to do this stuff, but he was willing to look at the industry differently. Mm -hmm. And so that was just this pedigree of like the definitive best American entrepreneur. And when he was doing that, the big three saw how big he was and how critical it was to stop his business because of what it would represent to them. And they crushed it. And after all his patents expired, you start to see fuel injection in 1957 coming into Thunderbirds and into Corvettes. And you start to see padded dashboards and you start to see disc brakes and all of this stuff. That he already to, did. That he had already done years before. Interesting. And, I mean, I'm sure he cared. I'm sure he wanted to make money on the idea, but he, it didn't stop him. He was crushed. It was like this massive upstart in the auto industry. It's this legendary story of how industry crushes innovation. And yet he turns around and invents a propane powered refrigerator to be able to keep things cool in the third world because he thought, hey, if we could keep medicine at temperature without having to have an electrical grid, we could make healthcare more deliverable. <laughs> Just like, who is this guy? So that's this, this, this icon in my mind. So it is my favorite car. Okay. I would like one. If anybody has a cool $5.6 million that they'd like to <laughs> donate to my car collection, there's 42 of them left. Every one of them is known in location. A couple of them are in the Smithsonian. I will someday make a Hajj to the Smithsonian just to see Preston Tucker's car. But uh, uh, The Smithsonian is really cool. So if you've never been there, I definitely recommend it has a Tucker. It doesn't need anything more than that. Oh, Carl's it has like, Dorothy that's all. slippers too. I mean, I'm oh, down wait, with that. those are cool. I've, been in that one yeah i don't think i saw the car or maybe i did and i just didn't realize it didn't you've know. wasted i've you've seen wasted the, your i've trip. seen this the, <laughs> the slippers though what a wasted trip <laughs> it's really cool though it, the smithsonian oh. is really cool so highly recommend we'll tag it on here beautiful america everyone should know go see it go <laughs> see it it is the history of who we are as a people and a culture so you liked cars and Loved cars. kind of getting... But I start seeing these innovators. And it also happens in the world of racing where good team bosses are these huge innovators where they look at things and they go, I know the rules say this, so this isn't technically illegal. And so I'm going to do this. And until they change the rules, I'm going to get away with this. And it's kind of become this like spirit of who I am as a person. I look at the way the rules work and the, uh, the I, I'm going to misattribute this. I, I, I think it's a, a, a Jurger quote, but he said, don't race the car, race the rules. Mm. Right. So if everybody else is out there racing a 350 and everybody else is out there racing a 350 turbo tranny and everybody else is out there racing a, you know, late 1960s, whatever, they all have to race against each other. If you read the rules and figure out where the rules have gaps, then your car will be better. And so I've always looked at industry that way. And so as I came into healthcare, I mean, again, having, you know, my, my, my MBA at the kitchen table, right. But then I also sought to get my formal MBA in mm -hmm. healthcare. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a formal training in the industry. So I walk into this industry that's filled with people that are saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. And this is what the rules dictate of us. And this is what the industry market pressures require of us. And I, I didn't have to fit into that because I, I was bold enough to be willing to be wrong, to ask the stupid questions that, I, I, and I, I'm going to say this, 90% of them are stupid questions. People look at me like, because that's flat illegal, you can't do that. Because people would die, you can't do that. But every now and again, you ask a stupid question, everybody looks at you and goes, well, I have no idea why we don't do that that way. But none of them would be, because they, you, know, you, you, you become inculcated into this environment that you exist in. And so as a result of that, you stop asking those questions. It's happened uh -huh. to me now in healthcare 10 years in, but while you're new and fresh, you can ask these boldly innovative questions because you don't actually know the answer and you find things that exist in that space that create massive innovation. And so a, I started doing- A disruptor doing, in like a, that's what you remind me, like a disruptor in a, such a great way of built, pulling out those new innovative things that- Will you go back and tell my kindergarten, kindergarten teacher that? Because yes. she thought I was a disruptor in a different way. No, but I think, no, but you're, it's unique. I don't think everyone is like you, which I think is cool because you, you do disrupt. And, and I think that's such a compliment and like a, 
disrupt in a good way that creates yes. innovation yes. and s solves problems yes. and finds solutions to things. It has to start with mission focus. I mean, it just has to. You have to have a mission in life. You have to have a mission in a company. You have to have a mission in an enterprise. You know, whatever it is that you're set out to accomplish, you have to have a mission. And then you can be disruptive as long as it's in the interest of that mission, right? So, I mean, even even here, right, in the office, we start talking about how it is that we can innovate, you know, between all of the different entrepreneurs and between the entrepreneurs and, and be set in the groups and how we, like, get everybody involved and connected and together and stuff like that. There are a thousand ways that we can look at things that people have done before. I choose not to look at those. So if the goal is getting people together, why aren't we utilizing different techniques to do so? And so then you see, you know, a bunch of people sitting around the office on a Friday afternoon having a social hour, right? And it's free speech and it's good whiskey and it's whatever topic of conversation we put together and curate. But then all of a sudden you have this deeply empathetic trust, which is what the relationships are built on, that then becomes a safe space for people to be innovative idiots where they start asking dumb questions. And so somebody comes in and says, you know, I run this company and my company does this and I've got this problem. And you've got 12 minds at the table that don't know anything about your industry. They're just absolutely ignorant and they start asking dumb questions. And all of a sudden you go, wait, 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 wait. What was that dumb question you just asked? <laughs> what was that silly idea you just had? That's actually not that problem. silly. And boom, you blow forward in that space. Same thing with the golf tournament that we're having, where if anybody doesn't know, and I'm hoping this becomes an annual thing, there's been a collaboration between uh, the entrepreneurs at Rock 31 and uh, uh, EDA to have a golf tournament. And it's mini golf and it's nothing that anybody cares about. In fact, actually, we have a golf hole in here. I was <laughs> in secretly right hoping now. that somebody would like golf their way golf. in yes golf their I way into the video. podcast yeah. i would love it i would mm -hmm. not interrupt their golf we would we would hold our own quiet signs up yeah. and just be silent <laughs> please it. but golf um <laughs> it's 20 minutes of networking time where you get to sit down with somebody undistracted by anything other than a silly putter and get to know them and the conversations derived around the first hole of golfing and the second hole and the third hole and the fourth hole are built around building empathetic trust and mutual relationship and professional acumen. And I have not, I have not, and I challenge you guys to, to observe this. I have not seen a single round of golf end at the last hole. When they get done, there is 20 minutes of meaningful conversation about the business that that person runs and about the programs that the other person runs and how they can work to network together or how they could refer each other to different people. Mm -hmm. I don't care about golf. I'm not good at golf. <laughs> I'm not good I have I have all of the clubs from 25 years ago. I have a stupid hat, but what I care about is getting to know people, and this mm -hmm. is a vehicle for doing that. And so, is it different than having a luncheon? Yes. Is it different than forcing people into a closed space to have conversation? Yes. Is it more effective? I don't know. We'll look at the data when it comes out, right? And if it isn't, then there won't be a golf tournament next year. But does it accomplish the mission? I think right now I'm seeing that it does. Yeah. Yeah. And if it doesn't, the next year we'll invent something new and different. And if a couple of years down the road, none of my ideas have worked, we'll go back to, you know, <laughs> having Jimmy John's and staring at each other. Talking to each other. So now that you've kind of talked about, you know, how you keep your innovative thinking and, you know, you utilize others to help you keep yourself creative. Yes. Um, well, what keeps you motivated? Oh, helping others. Helping others. Again, quotes from my parents have driven me forward and you just hold on to some of these things. I think we're all the same way. What's your favorite quote from your parents? So from my dad in particular, he said, your checkbook will never be more valuable than your black book. Invest in the people around you and you'll find success. I love that. Just absolutely love that. And it's inherently true. So the thing that keeps me motivated, and especially in this environment, it's been a blessing to be in this environment, is there are so many different people that are open to open conversations. They're willing to help me with my problems. And I am reciprocally willing to help them with theirs. And it, it helps me keep things sharp. Um, another colleague asked the other day, they're like, how do you, how do you keep a skill set like this practiced? Um, specifically talking about development. where you, I mean, if you're lucky, you'll get to do three development projects in a career, maybe four. I mean, they just, they, they have such a long run up. So how do you, how do you get good at doing something that you only get to do four times in your life and they take years to accomplish? And I said, well, I, I do 12 development projects a year. One every three or four years actually gets done. But I look at an opportunity, I see it for what it is. And I go through the academic process of completing the entirety of my side of the work. 
And if it's a good idea, then I go out to find funding on it and we see if we can actually get that thing funded and built. Yeah. But if it isn't, I'm usually done with my side of it inside of about 90 days when I go look at the next one. So I'm going this afternoon to look at a downtown building that might be for sale and see whether or not I can develop an idea for what would go into that space and look at funding and look at appropriateness and look at who lessers would be and what kind of programmatic uh, developments we could put into that space. Am I going to buy it? I don't know. I mean, if, if the numbers work out, yeah, absolutely, because that's good business. And if the numbers don't, I will have practiced that. Because you do business all over, Anywhere like our region, works, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. which is... Yeah, I have uh, I have businesses in uh, Montana and Wyoming right now, specifically. The history of my company has worked recently in Montana, Wyoming, and North Dakota. Uh, my company, uh, Health Management Services. Um, I have, historically, we've done things as far away as New Mexico. I'm open to doing things anywhere the business works. I've got employees as far flung as the Philippines. I mean, we just kind of wherever we need to be to do stuff. Um, but and you're yeah. remote. You have a remote staff, yes. right? That's Generally, right. when COVID came through, we democratized staff and allowed people to work from home, and we've stayed in that space. I have a very, very professional staff that works to my rigor <laughs> and demands, and they love doing that. And so I can trust them to stay at home and work at home, and they've never missed deadlines. They've never missed projects. They deliver better than when we were all together. Which is telling of your remote leadership, which I think is harder than having people in a space. If it, it seems like remote is just different. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard to build a culture when everyone's virtual. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, to have people that have been with you longstanding and are doing really well through the vir virtual platforms um, and then still enjoying their culture, I mean, that's a, a huge say to your leadership. Well... I'm going to innovate in this conversation. Does, <laughs> does culture have to matter? There's this Michael Porter quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Yeah, we used that as, as a title of an event last year, actually. And, and I think to some degree, when you put people into a closed space where you're forcing them to be on top of each other and work in closed confines, that's always 100% true. I think we're venturing into a new space now in this post-COVID world where culture can take a back seat. You can't ignore it and it can't be toxic. But um, I hire people who look for individual relationships, not workplace culture. They're, they're introverts like myself. They like to know and be known. They like to have an intimate and personal conversation with people about the things that matter in their life and know that you know why they matter and who those characters are. But they are not looking for a go out after work crowd. They are not looking for, you know, this like big rah rah environment. Mm -hmm. And so, conversely, we have created almost an inverted culture where trying to get 50 people that get along with each other is not relevant to what we try and accomplish. I try to get 50 people that are deeply, deeply involved in um, EQ, you know, high, high emotional intelligence. And so my people care for each other as a, as a predominant characteristic. And the rest of it flows from there. I don't know that if we put everybody in a room together that, that we would have the culture that we have with everybody not in the room together. And then the question is, does it matter? And in some environments, it does, right? If I'm running mm -hmm. a manufacturing facility, I actually have to have people get along. You, can't, you, can't. <laughs> you need people there to do the things. <laughs> you can't have one person yeah. messing up their step because they're mad at the person on the next step. Right, <laughs> yeah. Don't throw things in the stream. There are people downstream of you. And you, what was the quote I saw? So undammed, the, the distillery in town. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, uh, treat the people downstream of you the way you would like the people upstream of you to treat you. And I thought, oh, what a great, I mean, he's a pastor. So what a great, you know, golden rule and, mm -hmm. and this principle. But it was, it was very funny. Uh, but finding something that works for your company and then building that and for what you need. So knowing it's family business, is your dad still? No, he's Well, he owns one or two large assets that I'm working on acquiring out from underneath him. But as far as operations are concerned, he's been retired for six and a half years or something like that. Congratulations, Carl's dad. Yeah. 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 Congrats. Yeah. It, was, it was an interesting process making that transition. My father and I have had many wonderful, wonderful experiences over the years. He was a hockey coach and he was this absolute wonderful hunter. And we've, you know, really bonded in those spaces. Also, there's a truck that I was 
was building that is now his, that was kind of a, you take it and you do it. So we've had both in our history. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, there's some unflattering things, but we're both pretty realistic about the fact that that's a part of our history as a father and son. I mean, we're intimately close. I love my father deeply and I deeply appreciate him. And I deeply appreciate the fact that he would hold lines that would cause those conflicts. Taught me to be a man where lines matter and that you hold those lines. And so I've held lines with him too. And it's one of those, like you teach that uphill all of a sudden you're like, yeah, but dad, this is a, this is a line for my family. And he's like, well, oh yeah. Okay. Which we <laughs> think <Touché>. is, <laughs> yeah. And we've been talking just Kayla and I a little bit too, which I think is cool that you're doing is, you know, those family businesses or family owned companies mm-hmm. that if you don't have that, you know, son or daughter that wants to take it over mm-hmm. or take it on, mm-hmm. then, what, you know, it gets like, you bought know? out or it, it closes down. Yep. The the University of St. Thomas, I'm going to plug the uh, the old alma mater here, but the University of St. Thomas well. has, and, and you guys should find links in reference to this, the, the Family Business Center. And other business schools may have this, but the, the, the college, the Opus College of Business has the Family Business Center at the University of St. Thomas. And they do a fantastic job of coaching families through transition. And I've talked with, the, we did not need using that we looked at the references that we had we pulled reference materials but we didn't formally engage them i've known a number of people that have formally engaged them if you are in a family business and there is a transition plan you should definitely look this group up and work with them because the dynamics are important i mean the company is not as important to me as a relationship with my father and that was very clear at the very beginning and we had to carve really clear hard lines around stuff where it's like this is thanksgiving this is not a business table Mm -hmm. We will not discuss business. Like we will discuss business when we schedule business meetings, the same as you would with any other colleague. And and that's a two way street. That's not me telling Mm -hmm. my dad. That's both of us having this conversation. And inside of that space, we will not approach family matters any more than you would with any other colleague. You know, the casual, like how are the wife and kids? Mm -hmm. But outside of that, this is business. Yep. Like you are my colleague. You are my boss. I am acquiring you. I am your customer in trying to purchase this business from you. And we, we weren't perfect. But but some of those things really, really helped. I think that's important to note um, because owning owning a business with family can get really tricky because sometimes it's hard for people to know those lines. Yes. And then it's also sometimes uncomfortable to draw those lines. Yes. And so, I mean, I owned a business with my mom. I love her. Um, but it was hard. Like, you know, going, it's a mother-daughter relationship and you had a father-son relationship. And it's, you know, where do they stop being a parent and they start being a boss or a parent or a business partner? And so um, I think it's really beneficial for everybody listening. Like if, if you're in a partnership or, you know, partnership with family, um, you know, it's, it's really good to draw those lines, know exactly what your job duties are and their job duties are. So you're not overlapping or overstepping. Um, so yeah, I think that is super important. And along with what Marcel said is we're seeing a lot of things in rural communities where their businesses that have been around for, 40 plus years. Oh, 10 Um, generations, some of these things. So yeah, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's like really long and the kids don't want the business. And so then they're in rural communities. And so if nobody else in that rural community or somebody else from this area wants to purchase that business, it just shuts down. And so it's really great to see that you're continuing that legacy by, you know, stepping into that role and taking on that business. There's also a lot of financial metrics that matter in that space too, where there's tools that are built, but they're not necessarily reflective of what's you know, kind of this general population downturn, mm-hmm. long arcing economic downturn, um, and, and not just, you know, things that are happening recently, but like generally speaking, ranches are not as profitable as they were, mm-hmm. right? So let's talk about a family ranch. You want to go buy a family ranch and it has to get valued at a certain point um, because of the IRS getting involved and, you know, all of these yep. taxes involved in in estate planning and estate transition, so it gets valued as a going enterprise, but there's not a fair way to reflect that the entirety of the industry is on a slow, gradual decline. And so you need a depreciated value as a function of that, because in order to buy it, you can't buy what it's worth today because you'll never be able to afford the payments at the end. So you have to be able to buy what it will be worth in the future, which is less than it's worth today. So selling somebody something that is a known loss is a very difficult thing because you run into all these regulatory bodies and stuff like that. I mean, they're phenomenally complicated. And if you don't go in thinking about it that way, you end up putting strain in the enmeshment of the parent relationship where it doesn't Mm -hmm. belong as opposed to the business relationship where you can sit across the table from somebody and say, 
I mean, like Marcel and I are not father and daughter. Your business is not worth what you think it is, Marcel, because of the fact that it's on the decline. And there's no way that it's going to be worth this in 10 years. And I have to be able to afford bank payments and mm -hmm. make my debt service coverage ratio 10 years from now. And so in that capacity, you can demand a price, but I cannot afford to buy it at the price. So if you're interested in selling, we have to find a way to value it at less than it is because of the known depreciation of this asset over time. Mm -hmm. That's fine when we're talking business. Try and tell your dad that. Try and tell your mom that. Try and tell your son that or your daughter that. That's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. I know you think you built an empire and it's grand, but it ain't worth what you think it's worth. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, we, we do bump into that a lot where businesses are like, well, I think it's this much. And then it's really not that much. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have, they built that up from the, the ground up. Their blood, sweat, and tears are yeah. in that. You know, all of their savings, everything is is into this business. And so they obviously have a higher value to it than um, like if a valuation was going to occur on the business. Yeah. And so I think it's always a bit of a, a, sh a shock when they go, actually, your business isn't worth a million dollars. It's worth six hundred thousand dollars yep. you know so well and for a lot of business owners that's their entire retirement yep um when you get the irs involved um for instance you could approach my parents tomorrow and if they wanted to they could sell you the whole enterprise for a dollar yep it's their choice there are three people on the planet that cannot buy their enterprise for a dollar myself and keely who lives in saint paul also my older sister and eric rude who lives in saint paul my kid brother <laughs> Everybody else on the planet could buy that thing for a dollar. IRS gets involved and says, no, it is worth this. And they use mechanisms that look at growth in industry that's not present, right? And so we talked about like the hardest years in nursing homes have been the last three. But it was generally on a downturn, especially here in rural America. Rural nursing homes have been really struggling. Like they were on the verge of closing anyways, which is why 13 of them sunk in a very brief period of time. And so I'm trying to buy a business and the IRS is saying it's worth this. And I'm like, it is not. It is not. Even my parents are agreeing. It is not. Like this industry is not climbing on the way out. It is descending into a landing point. And you get this dollar valuation back that is absolutely supported by third party experts that say, this is what you have to pay for this. And you're like, I can't buy it because, because I'll be able to make payments on the first year, but historically it'll get eaten by inflation. And by year five, I can no longer make payments unless something changes. So it's a really, these dynamics, and they are, I mean, that's my industry, but they're present in a lot of rural American industry. And so we have to find ways to innovate in that space. We have to ask dumb questions. We have to look at things and say, if the mission is this, you know, why, why can't we, why can't we play mini golf until we succeed? Yep. You know, if, if, if mm -hmm. this is where the finish line is, do we have to go there in a car? Can we go there by plane? You know, or a tandem bike? That? Yeah. Let's get on my daughter's segue and <laughs> the thing yes. is beeping and whistling and blowing <laughs> blue light all over the house this morning as I was trying to finish my sleep. But yeah, I mean, the, you know, can we do things differently than we intended to? And so I get, I get to do that in healthcare. I, I'm very, very blessed to have been able to come into a company that was stable to buy it, to navigate some of the industry things that we have. I've merged with a company. I acquired a company in home health. Um, so I have another company called Devotion Healthcare. And, and I um, acquired a 20-year-old brand of home health in rural Wyoming. It's a fantastic company. It had great pedigree, um, real wonderful owners that sold it to me who have now since become very good friends of mine. We talk weekly about you know life and everything else. Um, and then we merged with a, a partner in Casper, who had Epsilon Health Solutions. So now Devotion Healthcare has those three locations. We're starting one here in Billings. And so we just kind of have this like spectrum of analysis. And so I, I've often, when I go to you know talk with legislators about this kind of stuff, they'll ask like, you, know, you, you speak so definitively about the market space, but everybody speaks definitively. I'm like, but I, I'm probably the only person who's pulling on your ear that represents home health, nursing homes, assisted livings, adult daycare, hospitals, and advocacy. And they're like, oh, I said, so you know, I can see why the hospitals want this. I can see why the nursing homes want that, but they're pulling on two ends of the rope. And I sit here and I can't, I can't put one business out of business for the benefit of the other business. They can pull intentions. I'm going to say egocentrically, like looking singularly at their spot in the market space. I have to pull the rope in a way that it makes it work for everything I do. And a legislator go, oh, I should listen to you more. I said, I don't know that you should listen to me more, but you should consider that when mm -hmm. we have these conversations. Because <laughs> I don't want one to sing right. and the other to like, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can't, I can't, you know, shoot myself in the foot just to get the, the thing done. So, 
So what are some things you have on the horizon that you're looking forward to? Time with my nephews that starts this afternoon. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I uh, just started playing recreational hockey again with some of the old buddies of mine and they, you know, jeered me and drug me back into the rink. So I'm fat, old and out of breath and I'm enjoying playing hockey. It's been beautiful. Um, I've Who's got your team? <laughs> it's it's a lunch puck. We don't really have a team. I <laughs> show up and they, you know, it's, it's like the old playground days, mm-hmm. you know. I'll pick you and I'll pick you and I'll pick you. And eventually one of them gets stuck with me. And so then they have me. So <laughs> yeah, it's not competitive other than that. I like to make things competitive, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to those things in the personal world. My wife and I celebrated our 10th anniversary. I'm looking forward to our 20th. Congratulations. That was, yeah, was fantastic. So this is a big month for you. This has been big. 40, 40 10th, 10th anniversary. anniversary. Yes. Hockey. Yeah. 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 The return. The return. Yeah, the return to hockey. I'm sure it'll be on ESPN 8, the Ocho. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Carl, I have another question for you. It just prompted me. So you do have a lot going on with your five different things you just listed off, plus a couple other things you have. Yes. In the fire, irons in the fire, you have kiddos, you're married. How do you keep organized? And then how do you, like, what do you do for self-care to keep yourself sane and organized and energized? I love this. I mean, I... I love this. So it isn't time away from things I love, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, My faith first, my wife second, my kids third, and then business. Um, It it, it, it just energizes me to no end to be able to use a mission-based company to achieve things that matter and that inform those. I can use that to teach my kids. I can use that to inform the future for my wife and I's relationship. And I can definitely use that as a ministerial outreach in the world to just do good. And that just lights a fire in me. So to some degree, it isn't a distraction from other things. It is the thing. If I can get away from it, I love to hunt and I love to fish. Mm -hmm. But realistically speaking, this is yeah, fly fishing. Well, there is no other fishing. Uh, yeah, I, I don't fish. We so, refer to the know. others as I like to plunkers of worms. Crab, crab fish. Drop the crab. I think that's in. just called crabbing, which is why crabbing. it's acceptable. I accidentally yeah. threw a fishing pole at a pond once, but we won't speak of that. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's now out in the world, but it was not. so close. It's, yeah. it's, it's I mean, it's almost the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. I was wanting to fly fish, so I like chucked the pole and the. Mm-hmm. And did you catch anything? No, because no. Did you retrieve the 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 yeah my mom the rod? did mm-hmm. perfect see victory in all fronts yeah exactly now now we'll get back to relearning that next time around <laughs> maybe this will be the spring endeavor we'll have a casting tournament on the main floor of Rock Thirty One ceilings are high don't you have to we can figure this out yeah where there's a will there's a way I'm sure we can we also it. know a guy who does rock treads I don't know if you've ever heard of them but you put them on your boots and they stop you from like slipping in the rivers the aluminum ones yes yes that's the coolest stuff and then also because they're not like foam mossy you're not tracking material from stream to stream his name's Forrest and he is fun yeah that stuff He's is awesome. really cool it, again like thinking about a problem and finding a way to get to a solution that works inside of the mission like I want fishermen not to fall in the river and drown but I also don't want to track junk from stream to stream. Wow. Fascinating to watch people solve these kind of problems. Just fascinating. <laughs> How do I keep organized? Boy, that's a great question. Um, I have a virtual assistant. Okay. Um, through Ben Marone, VA Tasks. Um, Mark keeps my life organized. And as I get, you know, innovations and in tasks where things are necessary for, for detail-oriented work, he does that. Um, I hire capable leaders, right? So we talked about that, like independent culture. Um, My father ran the company very differently than I did. He is a brilliant man, um, disciplined and organized beyond anything I could possibly imagine. His brain worked way better than my brain works. Um, He could run 10 or 12 facilities at a time himself, except they had to physically be there. So he hired staff and employees, generally speaking, that were very dedicated, uh, that were very execution oriented. And he did the dreaming, scheming, planning and innovations. Mm -hmm. And then he had people that would execute on them. So every location that he had, he had people that were really good COOs. I hire leaders 
that like to dream and I dream with them and then I help them innovate. My value is in the innovation and building a company that comes around behind them to support. So I just hire a different type of person. Um, our current president in health management services is somebody that was hired by my dad. She was an excellent COO in that world. She became an unbelievable executive as far as her, her brilliance in leadership and ability to like guide, govern, and look forward. Mm -hmm. And so with respect to her skills and talents, I've made her the president of that company. And it's a great example of like, I, I can't run that company myself yeah. while I do all the things that I like to do, but Kelly can, and she is fascinating and brilliant and capable. So I find empowered people. I empower them. I pay them competitively. I tell them what I want to see accomplished. And then I let them solve the problem. You know, I, I had a Marine Lieutenant uh, Colonel work for me for years, really became a great friend of mine. And he said, tell me what you want. Tell me when you want it and then get the hell out of my way. And I respect that. Yeah. 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 Get her done. Mm -hmm. Get her done. And, and I, giving people that space so they yeah. can do it how they need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. We had one conversation. I sent him into a meeting. He goes, I feel like this meeting's a little bit beyond what you've given me permission for in the past. And I said, you know, my kindness, speak with kindness. He said, yeah. I said, you know, my firmness and clarity. I said, be firm, be clear and set the expectations. He said, okay. I said, and never use language you haven't heard me use. And I think off the podcast, you ladies know that I use quite colorful language. <laughs> and this lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps looked at me and goes, We were surprised we didn't have to make this episode explicit <laughs> yet. <laughs> but he said to you. He said, those are pretty loose parameters, Carl. <laughs> He's a fantastic person. Again, you hire somebody that, that as a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps leads three to 5,000 people under his direct command. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. and you ask him to run a nursing home with 25 people. Like, yeah. He can He's got us. it. Yeah, I don't, I don't need to worry about you. I'll just watch the metrics move around and coach you when you need coaching. So I get to coach really cool leaders. I get to stand alongside really cool leaders. I get to watch what they do. I encourage their own innovation, and it allows me the opportunity to do the same in my world. And so I love growing businesses. I love building businesses. I love buying businesses. I'm not good at running them per se. At the point in time when it gets to be this like daily grind thing, I need a daily grind person. And so I hire empowered leaders that are looking for that position to be in control of something and run it on a daily basis. And they take pride in that. And so I think when you know what your skill set is and you know what your weaknesses are, you can really see what it is that you need to do to empower yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't spend a lot of time working on my weaknesses. No, which I, I love that. I, yeah. I mean, Gallup talks about that a ton and um, in different ways you know, wording, but just like really leaning into what you're good at and finding those people that are exactly good that. at what you're not good at to fill it. Um, which is great. So yeah. Carl, it's been so fun oh, having really you enjoyed this. Yeah, on this. Joy. Um, before we end each episode, we ask like three rapid fire questions that you can answer. So I'll start. Uh, what's your go-to coffee order? I don't care what it is. When I'm in the mood for caffeine, I have drank stuff that has sat in a pot for eight hours in the back of a holiday gas station. But if I get to be persnickety, I'm really persnickety. A single dry cappuccino. Okay. All right. Um, what's one thing you'd go back and tell your younger self? There is a Mother Teresa quote that became important to me in high school. And the end of the quote, I would, I'll, I'll, I'll misattribute it in its entirety. We'll Google it. But in the long run, you should, let me see how this is. When you choose to build, people could tear down the thing that you build tomorrow. When you choose to dream, people will see the foolishness in your dreams. When you choose to speak, people will seek your silence. But build, dream, and speak anyways. Because in the long run, it isn't between you and them anyways, right? Like the crowd and the critics don't matter. Find your mission. Know that your mission is true and pure. Move to your mission. Not that the ends justify the means. You leave awake in your path. But don't listen to the critics. I'm working on giving a town a free hospital. And I had a mayor that literally tried to stop me from delivering a free hospital. <laughs> just move on. Some people. <laughs> Smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay, last question. What's the best, so small business-wise, and it doesn't have to be the best one, 
that, but what's one of the best tips you've ever received? I, I would say I have never had a better or a worse boss than myself. So once you've done all the studying, once you know where you're trying to head, when you know that there's a safe space for you to land, tell your W-2 that you're done. Thank them professionally on the way out the door in case you ever need to go back and start working for yourself. You will be the worst boss you ever had. You will burn the midnight oil. You will think about it in the morning, but you will also have the freedom to do the things and innovations that you want to have. So yeah, be your own boss. Embrace it fully. You know, that getting rid of the W-2 is huge. You have to burn the ship. Otherwise, you might sail home. Burn the ship and get after it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Carl. Now I keep thinking about pirates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mary. Well, I mean, you know you're visiting when you keep the ship, right? Yep. When you get there and you part the ship out to build your new cottage or you burn it to the ground, like, we're here. Elon Musk talks about colonizing, colonizing Mars, right? And I talk with my wife at one point. I'm like, our son is of the right age, that if he really wanted to be that person, he could be that person. And she's like, oh, that would be so cool. It'd be so neat. I said, they're not coming back. They're burning the ship. They are burning the ship. This is not, a, this is not walking on the moon. It is not possible for us to go to Mars and return and tell the story. Like, we will have to raise a boy that burns the ship. Our daughters also could do it, and they will have to burn the ship. I have one daughter that might burn the ship before it gets off the ground. But, <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it's a, always so figure it out later. It's you a know. different mentality. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're not coming back. This is you, know, you think about the people that sailed over here and founded this country. They weren't going back. Some of them died in the pursuit of it, and eventually they carved out what I think is the greatest nation in the history of the world. And when we go to Mars. People might not make it. Well, they will die on Mars. Hopefully they live out the rest of their natural lives in the pursuit of science and excellence and, you know, colonizing a new planet, but they will die on Mars. Whether it's two weeks in or 50 years in, these are burn the ship people. Be that person, right? Be bold, have a plan, do the math, study it out, and then burn the ship. I love that. And Dean. Yeah, Thank you, Carl. Carl. Way to just drop the mic on your way out. <laughs> Mike, drop. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today. We really uh, appreciate really it. Glad to be invited. We really hope um, people were able to take some great things from um, our talk today. I mean, I know I was writing a whole bunch of things down, like of these great quotes that you had. I know each um, of them. Yeah, each of them. Marcel could probably see it like loading as we were going <laughs> through it. But um, yeah, thank you so much. It's always great to have you. We're uh, we're very happy to have you in the Rock Thirty One space. We bring. Um, really great information, expertise, and, and energy to the space. Thank you. I'm humbled to be here. I enjoy it. I'm glad you guys thought to do this. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. Thank you for joining. You can find the resources and tools mentioned in today's episode at thevault201.com. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe and share with a friend. Thank you to Big Sky Economic Development for supporting The Vault at 201 North Broadway. Big Sky Economic Development provides leadership and resources for business creation, expansion, retention, new business recruitment, and community development.